darkness, humidity, more darkness. You have been wandering in these caves for days now, searching for the legendary hammer of Lambda, and you found nothing so far. You enter a large room of typical Dwarven architecture. In the distance, beyond rows and rows of pillars, a bonfire flickers, illuminating a tall archway and the silhouette of a creature that appears to be standing guard. What do you do? What do you do, actually? You could do many things. You could take a bow and shoot at the creature. You could sneak, try to see what that creature is. You could, talk to to you could try to talk to it. You could decide to just run away. You have like many, many, many choices. So in essence, the snippet I just showed you here is what happens in a role-playing game. Uh, the two elements of a role-playing game are, or RPGs are one, you need a story, like an epic story, something in the line of, uh, uh, of Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, all these things. And, uh, and, and uh, the second element of the uh, role-playing game is instead of uh, most cases where you read a book and somebody decides for you what will happen, instead of cases where you watch a movie and the ending is predetermined, in a role-playing game, you get to decide what happens. Like, uh, you don't get to observe and decide this was a bad choice. You can actually try it out and uh, choose your own adventure. So at that point, you might ask yourself two questions. Like, one is, like, who is this person? And two is, like, why are we talking about Dungeons and Dragons? After all, NDC has a D, and D is not Dungeons, it's not Dragons, it's Developer. So why are we talking about D&D &D here? So first, my name is Matthias Brandevinder. You can find me on Twitter as uh, at Brandevinder. And uh, usually, uh, the type of talk I give revolves around functional programming and machine learning. So I'm pretty far out of my normal zone of talks. So the reason I wanted to talk about this is uh, a long, long time ago when I was a teenager, uh, I got into Dungeons and Dragons. I read the rules, I knew all the rules, I was very excited, and I never found a friend to play Dungeons and Dragons. So this is very sad. It's one of these things where I thought, fine, is like, uh, it's one of the things on the bucket list which will never happen. And then like two years ago, I got into a bit of a burning uh, phase and a friend of mine told me, you know what, we should play Dungeons and Dragons. So this was great. And uh, lo and behold, we started playing and I started to being the, uh, the dungeon master. And so if you have played D&D uh, &D before, uh, DMing is kind of tricky. You need to know all the rules. You're kind of the one who keeps the house together. Uh, and so being uh, who I am, being a developer, I thought, fine, if I need to know the rules, there is one way to check if I know them. I should be able to write them in code. Once I have them in code, I know I know the rules. So that's one of the start of the talk was that. It's like, let's try to encode the D&D &D rules into f -sharp. The second side was being a software engineer. I thought there are lots of things where tools would be useful, so I started to script and to write code to help myself as a DM. So this is where I started. I thought it would be a couple of weekend projects, like hint, uh, it's been like one year and a half and I'm nowhere close to being done with it. But what I noticed in the process was what I was doing on D&D was actually pretty close to things I would do with business applications. I encountered similar patterns, stuff like that. And so I thought, how about I use this as an example and share like what I've been doing with this so that I can show you some of the tips and tricks I've gathered around, along the way uh, doing f -sharp on D&D. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So we're going to start an epic campaign, which is going to have like four arcs. The first one is like, I'm going to talk a bit about what is D&D. So uh, my experience has been like a lot of developers actually know D&D. Some of you might not, so I figured I should talk a bit about that. Then after talking about D&D, I'm going to try to model monsters with f -sharp and show you like how that looks, maybe show you a couple of tips. Then we're going to go into modeling dice, like dice being a big element in the game, so how about we would model that? And finally, I'm going to show you my pride and joy, which is my uh, simulator of combat in D&D using Fable Elmesh. So four chapters in our epic. So let's start with D&D, uh, uh, the game and the rules. In general, a game is about agency. Agency is about like you're taking an actor, like a player, and putting them in an environment and letting them making decisions. So what makes a game interesting is two things. The first one is like if you make a decision, something should happen. It's like if whatever you do, the result is the same, it's not a fun game. So that's what you need first, is like decisions with results. And if you want to make the game interesting, the, the results of your decisions should not be completely random. 
if, uh, because uh, if it's random or if it's not random, then you know that when you make a smart decision, good results happen. When you make a bad decision, bad results happen. And that way, like when you win, you know you were smart and you were a good player and this is rewarding. So this is why you need rules. So uh, there are like many, many role-playing games around. D&D happens to be the oldest one. Uh, it was published in the first in 1974. I was kind of shocked to see how old the game was. And there have been like many, many iterations. So I'm going to be talking about the current version, like D&D 5th uh, edition. For the anecdote, like you, would, uh, you might think that there are only five versions. Actually, I think it's the fifth, 14th version of the rule. So it's, like, it's not only in software that people have like versioning issues. And uh, so it was the first role-playing game created, and it's uh, Tolkien-inspired. Uh, it's actually not quite true. Like, uh, I, I made the mistake of saying this once, and of course somebody corrected me on the internet, and apparently the inspiration was Conan the Barbarian. But like, roughly think about Lord of the Rings. If you want to play Dungeons and Dragons, like the one thing you need is the core rules, which is called the PHB, or Player Handbook. So the official uh, book is like 316 page, pages, and if you want, there is actually a free version online, which is 180 pages. So like our spec, the core spec of the thing we're trying to model is already 180 pages. If you really are serious about it, what you really need is probably three books. You need the PHB, 300 pages, the Dungeon Master Guide, 300 plus pages, and the Monster Manual, also 300 pages. So now we're talking about something like a spec of 1,000 pages, which is probably, in hindsight, why one year and a half later I'm still working at it, like I was a bit naive at the time. Uh, and uh, when you play the game with the rules, uh, there are a couple of things which happen. It's like one is like you have two roles. Uh, you have the players and you have the dungeon master. So the players are kind of the heroes of the adventure. They get to decide what they want to do. And uh, the second role is one person, the dungeon master. The dungeon master is kind of uh, the person who keeps the world together. Uh, you, you explain to the players what they see, you describe the world, and you tell them what happens when they do things. So you're kind of uh, in a godlike position. Uh, in the game also, you have two slightly different phases. You have roughly a phase which I would call like role play, which is pretty flexible. It's mostly about storytelling. It's about like uh, uh, having a dialogue with, uh, with creatures, making plans, all that stuff. So this is fairly flexible. And you have a second phase, like historically the game borrows from uh, war games. And so whenever you have combat, which happens quite, happens quite often, like if you've uh, watched Lord of the Rings, that should not be a surprise. And when you move into combat, it becomes quite rigid. You have turns, you can do certain things on your turn and so on and so forth. Uh, being a software engineer is like, uh, so modeling the first piece, creating like automated storytelling is a very hard problem. Uh, software engineers tend to automate the dumb and easy problem. So we're going to focus mainly on modeling uh, combat and like uh, the, the war game part of Dungeons and Dragons. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the domain modeling of uh, the rules in, uh, in F-Sharp. So what I said was like, uh, uh, for the game to be interesting, you need to have some information so that you can make informed decisions. So if I describe to you, you were to encounter one of these two creatures on the corridor, obviously these are very different. Like on the left, we have a goblin. A goblin is roughly feet, four feet high, very light, mean, a bit dumb, quick. The creature on the right is huge, that's an ogre, like typically eight to nine feet, like uh, maybe three to 400 pounds, uh, pretty strong. So if I told you like you're meeting a goblin or you're meeting an ogre, we need a way to describe like if you did things to it, like what should happen, how could you describe the type of interaction you would have with it? The way this is done in the rules or the description for monsters is using uh, stat blocks. So a stat block is a sheet like this, like this, which is telling you essentially everything you need to know about a goblin in the game. And so you have a couple of blocks. We're going to use, we're going to look at a couple of them. But the one I want to focus on first is this block in the middle, which is describing the characteristics of a goblin. So what do you see on the stat block for a creature? Player handbook, page 173, you have abilities. Six abilities provide a quick description of every creature's physical and mental characteristics. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Fine. How would I go about this in F-Shop? I would use a type called the discriminated union. So you can think of it maybe as an enum. We're going to talk about it more. So what I have here is I have an ability, and an ability can be one of six things. Strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Exactly what I showed you in the rules. Move on, we are done. Great. Move on in the player handbook, page 173. Abilities. Each of a creature's ability has a score. 
a number that defines the magnitude of that ability. Like a high score means you're very strong, a low score in strength means you're weak. How would I do that? I would uh, describe it using a type called a record in F-sharp. So a record would say, great, if I have a creature, the creature should have scores. I need one, of, one, uh, one score for each of the abilities. So I will have one, one strength score, an int, one dex score, an int, con score, an int, and so on and so forth. And we can move on. Now we have a way to describe the, the abilities of my creature. How would I work with these abilities? Suppose, for instance, that I wanted to know what is the dexterity score for my goblin. The way I would do that is by using something called pattern matching. So pattern matching says that you de define something which has six shapes, like dexterity, strength, and all of this. So I would say, to get the score, I'm going to write a function. To do that, I need two things. I need the ability I care about, like dexterity, for instance, and I need to know the scores for the creature. And so now I would say, great, like you asked me about the score. Which one is it? It could be strength. In that case, I'm going to give you the strength field from the scores. If it's dex, I'm going to give you the, the field dex from the scores, and so on and so forth. So I match on the six shapes, and I retrieve the value I want from the record. Modifiers. Each ability also has a modifier. To determine the modifier, subtract 10 from the ability score, divide the total by two, round it down. That's the rules again. I forgot like the page from the PHB, but it's from the PHB. And to do that, that's simple. All I would need to do is like I would say, fine, write a function, modify a function, is going to take a score which is an int, and I'm going to do score minus 10 divided by two. Move on, we have that part modeled as well. And so at that point, we are ready to ask questions like what is the modifier for the strength of a goblin? So uh, I have a record for a goblin, so my goblin has a strength of eight, a dexterity of 14, and so on and so forth. The, uh, I could write this two ways. One is I could write this like a, a typical uh, way, which would be first get the score for the dexterity for the goblin, wrap that in, and make a function call modifier on this. That's nice. Uh, there is a way which is maybe uh, nicer using the pipe forward operator uh, in F-sharp, and so I would say if I want uh, the dexterity score, I'm going to take a goblin, I'm going to push my goblin, so to speak, into the score functions, and we to say, take the goblin, give me the score for the dexterity for that guy, and push the result into the modifier. So this gives me like a pipelining style where I can see, take the input, do something, do something, do something until you're done. And, uh, and uh, this is it. So this is essentially most of what you will need to uh, do domain modeling in F-sharp. What I showed you so far is something which is called sometimes pompously algebraic data types. If you go to a Wikipedia, you will find the following definition for an algebraic data type. It's a kind of composite type formed by combining other types. It's the type of definition which is great, like it's uh, completely correct and also completely useless. Like you read this and it's like it's true, but like what do I do with this? So I think one way to think about this is algebraic data types have like two shapes or two types. You have some types and you have product types. Some types is what I described as a discriminated union and one way to think about it is like whenever you hear an or statement, what you want is a sum type. For instance, I said like an ability can be dexterity or strength or wisdom or this or that. That statement indicates that the type you're talking about is probably a sum type and you probably want a discriminated union. By contrast, what I said was a creature has, a, has six abilities. I have dexterity and strength and intelligence and wisdom. In that case, whenever you hear and, what you probably want is what's called a product type, which is either a record or a tuple. And that's pretty much all you need to do a domain modeling. At that point, you can level up. You have now a new skill, which is algebraic data types. Level two, let's move on. So let's go back to our stats block. Uh, so now we looked at this section here, which was about the characteristics or the abilities. What I want to look at is the section at the bottom, which is describing what a goblin can do. And what the goblin can do is it can attack you in many ways. So let's look a bit in detail. If you look at that stat block, you will see something like this. Uh, the goblin can make two attacks. It can use a scimitar, which is kind of a sword. It's a melee weapon, uh, has plus four to hit, reach five feet, one target, slashing damage. And it can use a short bow, do like range damage, and so on and so forth. So if I look at this, it's like, uh, I think uh, there is an obvious symmetry or like an uh, obvious parallelism between these two blocks. So, uh, what I'm kind of seeing is like uh, I have in each case, I have this and this and this and this. So this is probably uh, a record. I should probably be using a record to model this. So I'm, I'm seeing like uh, the weapon has, uh, the attack has a name, short bow or scimitar. It's a type of attack, ranged or melee, has a distance you can hit, sorry, has a, a, um, a bonus on the hit, has a range and all these things. So this is probably a record because we have an and statement. Good. No, 
Now, if I start to dive a bit further into the record, what I will see also is like I have an AND structure, but I have a couple of implicit ORs. If I look at the type of attack, I can see that I have either a melee weapon attack or a ranged weapon attack. That smells like a discriminated union. I look at this and I see I have a reach of five feet or a reach of 80 and 320 feet. It looks like it's either this or that, and I can do slashing or piercing, so this is also probably a discriminated union. So let's look a bit into the piece about melee and ranged attacks. Player handbook, page 146, every weapon is classified as either a melee or a ranged. A melee weapon is used to attack a target within five feet of you. A ranged weapon is used to attack a target at a distance. Fine. Range, player handbook, page 147, a weapon that can be used to make a ranged attack has a range in parentheses with two numbers. The first one is like the normal range, like you're shooting close by. The second one is the long range, like you're trying to shoot like beyond the normal range. So let's sketch out how the record could look like. In this case, so we have something like an attack record. I have a description which is probably a string. We're kind of looking at a type of attack we don't know. And right now we're looking at something which is the reach. And the reach looks like it could be either, uh, uh, it could be either five feet if it's a melee attack, or it could be something like 80, 320, which is a ranged attack. How would I do that? Well, I would use a discriminated union again, but uh, what I showed initially was just like labels with no data. One feature behind a discriminated union is you can also attach data to it. So in this case, what I'm really trying to say is a weapon has a reach. If it's a melee weapon, uh, it has a short reach, five feet. And if it's a ranged attack, it has like two numbers, either like 80 feet or 320. So now I can represent like uh, one thing, a reach, which can has two shapes. And now I can simply say my attack has a reach, which is one of these two things, okay? How do I work with this now? Because I have two shapes, I have different data. Fine, so I'm defining my type reach, melee of int, range of int and int. Now, if I wanted, for instance, to know how far can uh, you attack with a certain weapon, what I would say is like, fine, you give me the attack. First, let's look at the reach. The reach can be one of two things. It can either be a melee attack. In that case, I have one number, the reach. I'm going to give you that. If it's a ranged attack, I have the short range and the long range. So I'm going to retrieve the two pieces of information I have, and I'm going to give you back the long range, which is the second number. So now I can use the discreted union, attach data to it, and extract what I want by using pattern matching. If I, uh, so this is not very elegant. I use the discreted union, uh, I, and I use the tuple in it. Like I don't really know what's the long range, the short range, so how about we use a record again? And I'm going to say a ranged reach is re has two numbers, short range or long range, two ends. So now I'm kind of doing turtles all the way down. I can now say like a reach has a melee reach with one number or a range reach with two numbers. And now I can actually call the property on the record so that uh, it's much more explicit. I don't need to know where it's in the tuple. So it's clarifying how the code is written. Good, so I'm going to skip that. And so, so far, uh, we're doing actually pretty quick progress here because we have a fairly complete model of, uh, of attacks in uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the type of attacks you can do. If you look a bit at the code I wrote, the thing which is nice is I can represent both uh, the, uh, the scimitar attack and the bow attack. The problem is I can also represent things which I should not be able to represent. So, uh, which is why I call this a chimera. Like a chimera is a monster composed of multiple pieces which should not belong together. And the problem I have here is with the model I showed you is I could create an attack which has the following structure. I have this attack here which is the white attack, has the type melee, and has a reach, which is a range reach, with a short and a long range. This is not right. Like, uh, my attack should not be both. I, I want to have range, I want to have melee, but like this mixture is impossible. It's either one or the other. So if you spend a bit of time in the uh, F-sharp community or other functional communities, you will hear one mantra, which is try to make impossible states unrepresentable. What I don't like about the code I wrote is like uh, it allowed me to uh, represent the things I wanted to represent, but it also allows me to uh, represent things which should not even exist in my world. One way I could solve it is by having like try-catch blocks, like uh, validate all sorts of things. A much nicer uh, solution to the problem is like how about we don't do validation, we just remove the possibility of the problem in the first place. Uh, so how would I do that? Well, it's not very difficult. Is like I kind of hinted at it when I described it. Is like what I have is something which is both a melee. Uh, and has a range, that's not right. It's like really this is duplicate information. So the way I would solve it here, I would say my attack record has a description and has a reach. I don't need the type 
uh, because the reach is telling me either it's a ranged reach, in what case I know perfectly well that it's a ranged attack, or it has a melee range, and in that case I know perfectly well it's a melee attack. So I just collapse it, and now like uh, all, everything is sold, there is no way I can create something which is a hybrid, uh, I don't need try-catch blocks, and I can move on with my life, impossible state out of the way. So this is good. So, uh, so this was like uh, the first weeks on the project. I was uh, going at it, looking at the rules, modeling more and more stuff, and everything was fine. In the process, I encountered a couple of traps. So I wanted to talk a bit about the traps and maybe give you uh, some ideas on uh, what to look for when you're doing domain modeling. Uh, the first thing is like uh, uh, my naive view was the domain is very well modeled because you have a rule book. People can take the rule book and start to play, so this should be pretty clear and pretty easy. As it turns out, it's like it's full of lies or half truth. So first statement, uh, we started by saying like attacks look either this or that, and this is a good pattern for what you should see uh, in your code. Now, if you look a bit further in the monster manual, you will encounter other monsters. And uh, you could encounter a monster called a wyvern. So a wyvern is kind of a weaker species of a dragon. And if you look at the attacks for a wyvern, you're going to see something which is much more complicated than this. Like the wyvern attack, uh, it can attack with a stinger, like the tail. When it attacks you, it's a melee attack, plus seven to hit, which 10 feet, one creature. And this is like much, much more complicated than what we had before. And the rules didn't tell me that. So, so let's look a bit at the wyvern attack and see how we can uh, maybe handle some of the problems we have here. First thing, whenever a customer or a product owner tells you like this is true, it's always true, don't listen to them, they are lying. Like whenever people tell you it's true, what they mean is like it's usually true. And like this is, there is a blatant uh, lie in the rules. It's like I showed you the rules from the player handbook and it was saying like a, a, a melee attack, so, sorry, a some at the, uh, the reach of a melee attack should always be five feet. What do I see here? Reach 10 feet. So uh, the rules tell me something, I can find a complete contradiction in it. So first, anytime you have a spec, anytime you have uh, somebody who tells you like this is how it always works, uh, you should hear like this is how it usually works. Second thing, the difference with the goblin is like what we had was uh, uh, we saw that an attack had a type of damage. We had piercing, we had slashing. Here I can see that my uh, wyvern has piercing damage and poison damage. So one question in modeling is like do you have one? Or do you have at least one? And here we have like at least one type of damage, but we could have more. It's not very difficult to solve. It's like if I have at least one, I would probably want something like a list. So I would create maybe a type damage. And I would say like uh, damage type is piercing, poison, all these things. And my attack would have a list of damages. So if you are a nitpicker, which you should probably be, you would say like this is great, but now your model is not very good because you could have an attack with no damage at all. So you should really probably have a never empty list or something like that. But roughly, this is how you would solve it. So one or one or more. Second one is like one or maybe one. So what we had before was uh, just like the attack had a hit, damage and stuff like that. Here I can see that the attack has a lot of things which are like optional. The target now must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw. So it means like uh, when you attack, it's like you're also going to have a roll of dice and if you're not lucky, you're going to get poisoned and all these things. This is typically one of the cases. The way I would read this is like in some cases, you might see more information than what I told you. How would I do that? I would use something which is called an option type, and so I would probably represent it as my damage has a, a type of damage, and might have some special stuff, which is like optional stuff. I'm not going to detail how to do this, but like this, you would use an option here which says that usually you will have nothing, sometimes you might find more stuff. Third, third problem, or fourth problem I encountered was a light and heavy weapon. So if you look a bit at the rules, you will see that some weapons are heavy, a heavy weapon is a, well, a big weapon, like which is difficult to carry and so on and so forth. And a light weapon is small and easy to handle. So now given what I told you before is like it sounds like a weapon is either light or heavy. Sure enough, this has to be a discriminated union. And so I would go about this and I would say, great, I have a weight which is light or heavy. My weapon is going to be light or heavy and everything is fine. This is great, except that this is not right. Because like uh, what, what's not right here is a weapon can be heavy it can be light or it can be none of these things. And so now I have a problem because like when, whenever you use a discriminated union, the, uh, uh, the DU should tell you the truth, all the truth and nothing but the truth. In other words, like uh, whenever you have a, a discriminated union, like the thing you're looking at has to be one of the cases. I don't have this here. So how would I model this? Uh, definitely not light or heavy because like uh, I have the case which is neither. So uh, I could do this two ways. 
both are correct uh, or incorrect in slightly different ways. A first way to represent this would be to use the option type I showed before, and I could say a weapon could, uh, uh, could be light or heavy, possibly, or could have none of these things. So I'm saying like optionally, by default it has nothing, and some of them will be light, some of them will be heavy. The other way I could represent it is say I have three cases, light, medium, and heavy. So what's wrong and what's right about these? I would say like the second one uh, has an advantage, it's like pretty easy to work with. I can ask directly like is it light, is it medium, is it heavy? The thing I don't like about it is like the rules do not talk about medium weight weapons. That doesn't exist. So I'm introducing like an asymmetry, like the language I'm creating doesn't really exist in the domain. So I don't like that, but it's easier to work with. The other one is like more correct because it's really saying sometimes you will have heavier nights, sometimes you won't. The, the price you're paying for it is like you're going to have to navigate a bit more into the data to get what you want. It's a bit more complicated, but it's a bit more correct. So you kind of pick your poison. Both of them are wrong in different ways or right in different ways. Uh, so the, uh, the, the last thing you want to think about when you're modeling things is like, is the, if you want to uh, use a discriminated union, is like, is the type I'm looking at closed? What I mean by that is like the discriminated union should describe every single case. So initially, for instance, I looked at the rules and you have a long list of uh, existing weapons. So I thought maybe what I should do is have a list of the weapons and each of them is one of the cases. This is not a good idea because the discriminated union is closed, meaning it's not extensible. If along the way you find a new weapon which is not defined in the rules, you will not be able to add it, to, uh, to add, it, uh, add that weapon to the list. So if what you want is an extensible model where you might be able to add cases, you don't want to use a DU. So yeah, like questions to ask is like first is like, uh, uh, first like what people tell you is like uh, is potentially a lie. Second is like when, when you see one is like is it one or at least one list, one or maybe one option. Is it really closed? And do you have all the cases you want? And with this, you have pretty much all you need to do domain modeling with F-sharp. One thing I really enjoyed about this was, uh, so if I remember my days in C-sharp, is like I remember reading this advice, uh, uh, you should always use composition over inheritance. Uh, if you look at what we're doing here, this is exactly what we have been doing. I'm looking at my domain, and every time I'm asking, is it an and or is it an or? If it's an and, I'm going to use a record. If it's an or, I'm going to use a discriminated union. And I keep diving and diving and diving. And at some point, I have modeled everything and I can move on. And I'm, all I'm doing is I'm composing things together. There is no inheritance, none of that stuff. I love this because like, uh, it makes uh, essentially domain modeling trivial. Like All you have to do is like and, or, record, discriminated union, keep going, keep going, and at some point, you have a model. So this is nice. Now I want to talk about dice. So let's talk about dice. So dice are prevalent in, uh, in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Like people use all sorts of dice, like uh, fancy ones with four sides, uh, four sides, six dice, six sides, 20 sides, and so on and so forth. So what you will see is, for instance, in my attack, I have something which looks like this. The damage is going to be 1d6 plus 2, meaning like uh, I want to roll uh, dice with a six side and add two to the result. So how would I go about modeling this? First, like uh, being like a, a fan of like ubiquitous language, like what I would want, I would want to be able to model that in my language. So they are everywhere in Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, you have like D4, D6, D8, representing like how many sides you have, and you have like expressions like this. Maybe you will have like 5D10, add 15 to it, roll D4 twice, and sum it up. So it's like uh, you have dice everywhere, and uh, they are composed in uh, somewhat complicated expressions. So what we would like is that we would like to write something like this let attack equals 1d20, or damage equals 4d10 plus 2d6 plus 4 in code. That's what we're after. And I thought like, so how could I do that? And uh, then I remembered like in my adventures, is like I did encounter a, a legendary creature called Thomas Petrichek. So uh, I recommend checking his work, like he's on Twitter as Thomas Petrichek, and uh, Thomas is a legendary half elf wizard with a very high intelligence, and if you look a bit at his talks, you will see that in lots of cases, he's using one trick, which is uh, using discriminated unions to represent expressions, composing bigger expressions, and then working with these expressions. So I thought the dice stuff looks a lot like expressions. How about I use expressions uh, in the same fashion as he does to do that? So what I would like is to write something like 4d10 plus 2d6 plus 4. That's an expression. And if I, I, I look at this, what I see is like I see three things. First, I see something like 4d10. 4d10 is saying like I want a roll. I want to roll four times a 10-sided dice. 
The second type of thing I have here is four. Four is a value or a number, like it's, a, it's just a number. And the third thing I see is like the plus sign, which is saying like I can use addition to these pieces of expression to compose like bigger expression. So let's try that out and see if we can model this using F sharp. So I'm going to move into uh, VS Code. And let's try to uh, model uh, dice rolls as expressions. So first thing I need is I need a dice. So here I'm going to use like a classic trick. I'm going to say type dice. And I'm going to create a discriminated union which has a single case. So it's going to be D of int. And so what this allows me to do now is like I can do something like this. I can construct uh, dice by saying something D10. And if I do D10, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a dice which is D10. If I did D6, I would have like a dice as well. So first problem, now we have a dice model, good. Now is like, uh, let's go to the part which is a bit more interesting, which is like representing dice rolls. So let's say I'm going to have a type. Uh, what I said was a dice roll can be uh, a roll, can be a number, or can be an addition. Sure enough, that sounds like a, like a discrete union, so let's do type dice roll, which has like three cases. First case is going to be a roll. So if I have a roll, I need two things. I need to know how many dice I'm rolling, and I need to know, uh, uh, I need to roll uh, what type of dice I'm rolling. So fine, first case covered. Second case is I can have an integer. So I'm going to have a value, which is going to be simply a number. And the third case in my expression is like maybe what I have is like neither of these things, but an addition of these. So I'm going to have add of, and I'm going to do a list of dice roll. And uh, in four lines, what I have is like I have a complete model for the expressions I can write for dice rolls. I can make that as simple as I want and as complicated as I want. I can do something like this, for instance. So let me keep that on screen. I can write something like roll 4d10. This is a dice roll. I can have like value of 10. This is also a dice roll. And I can take these two things and I can say I want you to add these in a list. And this works. And if I wanted to go crazy, I could, uh, I could keep uh, composing more complicated things. I could say I want to add here another value, and I could uh, put another row, which would be something like maybe 2d4. So I can, uh, I can make my expressions as simple as I want. I can make my expressions as complicated as I want. I have now something which in code uh, expresses exactly what a dice roll is. So this is progress. It's good. Uh, the thing which is nice too is like I get like a, an expression model where uh, I'm uh, using, I'm getting all the help from the compiler, so uh, I will also get like syntax, like if I did a typo in here, it's like it's actually going to tell me that this is not valid. So I'm, I'm creating a DSL to represent roles, and I'm even getting validation for my, my own internal language like uh, off the bat, so this is pretty awesome. The thing which is not awesome here is like if I look at this, uh, this looks like uh, ugly compared to what I had. What I wanted to write was 46 plus two, what I have is like a roll for d6 plus a value of two. This is not quite what I want. So it's, it's functionally what I want, but it looks ugly. Can we make this nicer? Uh, cool. This is what people call a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, so let's try to do that. And so that's one trick I actually realized pretty late. I didn't realize it, but you can actually add methods to a discriminated union as well. So we're going to use a bit of trickery. And I'm going to do something like this. How about first, let's see if we can remove the add thing because that's pretty ugly. So I'm going to do something like this, member, static member. And I'm going to add an operator. And my operator is going to say, fine, if you give me a first roll, which is a dice roll, and a second roll, which is also a dice roll, then what I want you to do is I want you to give me back add of R1 and R2. So I'm just adding the plus operator to my dice roll. So why is this cool? It's cool because now what I can do is I can do something like this. I should be able to do this plus this. And I'm going to remove the rest because like it's not that useful. And now it's like, uh, and now I have something which still works. Oops, that's not right. I want a plus sign. And so now it's like, uh, I mean, I know it works because the compiler is telling me that it works, but like, uh, let's run it. I'm getting a dice roll, which is going to transform it into add of roll one, roll two. So the trick I'm really using here is I'm, I'm defining internally the language I want to use or the DSL I want to use, and then I'm creating small methods which are sort of act maybe as factories or like constructors to make the construction of the things I want nicer or cleaner. So this is already nicer. 
the, what is it, uh, another thing I don't like here is like what I would really want to write is roll 4d10 plus 10. Like this value of 10 is just ugly. So can we make that work? Sure enough, I'm going to use the same trick. I'm going to add a static member, static member plus. Whoops. And here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say maybe let's take like a first thing which is going to be a dice roll. And the second thing is going to be an int. And here I'm using a similar trick as before. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to return the sum of these things, except that instead of taking the value int, I'm going to wrap it into a value here. So now I'm transforming it again into a dice roll. So let's do that. And you can see already that it works because now my compiler is placated and tells me like, yes, this is a valid dice roll. So let's do that. And I can use the same trick to reverse it. So let's, let's do the opposite one. So I can do now, like a, I can take a value which is going to be an int and a dice roll. And I should be able to do something, add value of D and the roll. And so what does this buy me? This buy me now the following is that what I should be able to do is I should be able to do something like five, five plus roll plus 10 plus roll uh, two, D20, and so on and so forth. And so now it's like I have something which is already getting much, much closer to what I want. And if I keep using a bit of trickery like that, I can start to, uh, trans uh, to transform things and get closer and closer to what I want. Like another thing I would like, um, uh, uh, so okay, another thing I can do here is like this D10 is a bit ugly, so I could do something like this. How about I, take, uh, I create instances and say let's D4 equals D4, let's D6 equals D6. And now what I should be able to do is I should be able to do something like five, plus a roll for d4, and this will work. Good, so progress. The, uh, the last thing we would want to do is like, uh, if you look at this, this is a bit ugly, like a roll for d10. What I would really want is I would want to write something like for d10. This is not going to happen because I, I don't even know, uh, it's just not going to be possible in .NET, right? I can't do something like this because I would have a variable which starts with a, with a, with a digit. So I can't quite do that. The closest I could possibly do is do something like four times d10. And uh, you can probably see how you would do that because like all I would need to do would be to add a multiply operator on my dice construction and then I could do that and I could write like very clean expressions uh, composing all of this together. So instead of going in detail into that, what I'm going to show you is like the, uh, the sold version or the complete one. Uh, let me remove that and I'm going to Yes, I'm going to just take this here. I'm going to go all the way. So this is like using a couple of uh, all the tricks I showed you. And so like we started from something which was like add roll 66 value of four, roll something like this. And in the end is like what I'm going to end with is like something like this. 10 plus two times D10 plus five plus four times D8, which is like probably as close as you could get to the way the dice rolls are written in the rules. So this is nice, right? It's like I, I essentially now I'm able to write in code exactly what I had in the rules, I'm happy. What would I do with it? Well, if you have expressions, usually you don't do this for the sake of having expressions, you kind of want to evaluate them or do something with it. In this case, what I want is like, I want to evaluate the result of a dice roll. And so the pattern you would use is something like a recursive, like a, uh, an evaluation function, which is going to uh, recursively walk through the, uh, the structure and do something with it. For instance, if I wanted to evaluate a dice roll, I would say, if you give me a dice roll, that dice roll can be a couple of things. It can be a value. If it's a value, like it's a number of 10, I'm going to give you back 10 because I have nothing to uh, evaluate. If it's rolling four times a d10, I'm going to uh, do four times a roll and I'm going to do the sum of this thing. And if it's an addition, I'm simply going to say, take the rolls and evaluate what you found in the expression and keep going. So let's do that. So that's like a simple uh, evaluator. And now I can do something like this. I can take my dice roll and I can evaluate and evaluate and evaluate. And so uh, I don't know if the result is correct, but the result looks plausible. So I'm going to leave it at that. It's like uh, my code is maybe not true, but uh, maybe not correct, but it's not blatantly wrong. So that's fine, good enough for now. And I can do four for D10 plus two plus D12. And uh, yeah, again, pop, 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 pop. We have a nice evaluator. Cool, so let me go back to my slides for a minute. So what I showed here was uh, a pattern I saw quite often is like uh, using F sharp to uh, build DSLs using expressions. And all I did was like uh, I had, uh, I had like, uh, primitive values in my language. I just tried to model them first correctly without trying to be elegant about it. 
So I had like primitive values role, primitive value value, and some form of uh, operations, which allows me to write uh, correct expressions in my language. Then I have an evaluator, which is typically going to be recursively walking my expression to produce something out of it. And uh, this pops up in lots of places. So this is useful for Dungeons and Dragons dice, but uh, this pops in, um, in many areas. Like uh, you can use it, for instance, to maybe represent a web page, as a web page might be something like a body and a title and things like that. You can model it as an expression, take the expression and take a web page, transform it into HTML, transform it into Markdown. So you can use it in uh, all sorts of places. And the trick in general is like start by modeling the thing right and then use a bit of trickery uh, to uh, maybe operators, maybe, uh, maybe factory methods to create, uh, to make usage of the, of the DSL easier or closer to what you want. Good, so now that we did that, is like I want to move to the last part of our campaign, which is like, uh, uh, which is like Fable Elmish, and uh, the, my uh, combat simulator. So I, I did say, I did mention like uh, all the reasons I wanted to uh, do this project. So one of the reasons I wanted to do this was uh, the first time I played with uh, my players, is like uh, we played for a like half an hour, I gave them an encounter, and I nearly killed everybody. And so this is not fun, right? It's like you start your first game of Dungeons and Dragons and in half an hour you're dead. It's uh, nobody's idea of a fun game. So and, uh, and, uh, this, uh, the problem here was like, it was for me difficult to decide, is this a fair fight or is this not a fair fight? So one thing I've been uh, obsessing about is like, is it possible to use uh, tools to design a fair fight in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign to avoid like total party kill? So what is a fair fight? Uh, the way I would define it is like uh, if the players don't act like idiots, if the monsters don't act like idiots, then the probability of survival for the players should be reasonable. Define reasonable as 80%, 20% if you want a hot fight or an easy fight, but like you kind of want to know if everybody does the right thing, like uh, how difficult is this thing? So this is a bit of a tricky problem. Uh, and to do that is like uh, the, uh, I think I need two things. The first thing, is like I could try to compute the probability of, uh, the probability of uh, each of the outcomes. That's a very hard math problem. Uh, an easier way would be to do a simulation. Like uh, take five goblins, take your wizard, and let them fight a million times. And like uh, if the wizard survives like 70% of the time, it's probably what the probability of the fight is. And uh, to do that, so to make the simulation work, like the problem I have is like I need to have all the rules because uh, the simulation needs to use the rules. And so I need to implement all the rules of the game and I need to also implement automated decision making. Because if I want the system to play one million times, I don't want to play one million fights by myself. I want the computer to do that. So I need the goblins to play, I need the wizard to play and so on and so forth. So let's look a bit at what it means to be in combat. So in combat, player handbook, on your turn, you can move a certain distance and you can take one action. It's a bit more complicated, but like uh, it's, uh, it's roughly correct. So what this means in practice is like when it's your turn to play, for instance, if you had 20 feet speed, you could move north, five feet, move west, five feet, attack a goblin with a sword, that's your action, move north, you still have five feet left, you can just stop, uh, stop there. So that's how a combat round looks like. How would I model this? Uh, what I had was like uh, during my turn, I can do a movement or an attack. Guess what? I'm going to use again a discriminated union. So I'm going to say that your action can be either move in a certain direction or you could attack somebody with a weapon or you could decide to do nothing and finish your turn. To know what's happening in the game, like if you tell me I move north, I kind of need to know where you are. So I need to keep a bit uh, of state because otherwise north from where? So I will need to keep also states, things like for each creature, where are you, how many hit points do you have, and all that stuff. And then, so a couple of uh, technical details. So now I have states, I have actions. All I need now to uh, simulate a game is an update function, which is going to take a state, like this is where everybody was. This is the action which came in, like you did this action, I'm going to take that message and I'm going to match if it was a movement, I'm going to update the state and give you back the state. If it was an attack, I'm going to perform the attack and give you back the state. And so now I can just apply action, message, 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 and see how the state moves. So this would look something like this. I would have a list of commands, which would look like this. Creature one moves north, creature one moves west, creature one attacks, blah, 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 blah. And to resolve how the world looks like, I would say here is the initial state, the commands you gave me, fold it, and this will give you the state today. If you've been doing anything like uh, event sourcing, like this should look awfully familiar. So I'm not going to elaborate on this, but like uh, event sourcing and functional are a really, really nice match. 
Another thing which is a good match is something called Fable Elmish. So Fable Elmish is a project which has been uh, uh, garnering a lot of steam in the F-Sharp community. And Fable Elmish is Fable plus Elmish. Uh, so what is Fable, what is Elmish? Fable is an F-Sharp to JavaScript transpiler. Like uh, it does F-Sharp to Babel. So what it does is you, you take F-Sharp code, you give it to Fable, and it gives you JavaScript. And Elmish is a pattern which is coming from a, a language called Elm, which is an implementation of the model view update uh, pattern. So let's talk a bit about that. The model view update pattern uh, works this way. The arc it, it's literally all this is. So to make it work, uh, you need, uh, the, the core idea is you, you have a model. The model is your state, like how your application looks like right now. And uh, you will have a model, you have an update function, and the update function is expecting messages. So whenever a message arrives in the update function, it's going to update and give you a new model. And then it waits, and if a new message comes in, update is called again and gives you a new model, and so on and so forth. To make that work, you need uh, also an, uh, an initial state. So you need to provide an uh, init function, which is going to give you the starting state of your application. And like, whenever you do this, whenever the model is updated, there is also a view function, which is going to look at the model and automatically update the UI for you. Like in Elmish, it's using React. So it's like uh, whenever the model changes, it does smart things and gives you a fresh update of the view. So uh, now let me show you like my pride and joy uh, the uh, the D&D combat simulator, which was built in F-Shop Elmish. So let's go here. I'm going to go here. Again, I'm going to be in VS Code. And so the, uh, the my code is here. So this is like a F-Shop code. Uh, I have like, a, this is my entire model. Like I'm going to give a link later to the GitHub repository if you want to look at it. I'm not going to go in detail in it. But like the, the point I want to make here is like, this is my application. These are like four F-Shop uh, files. There is no JavaScript, nothing like this. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do uh, CD fable, whoops. CD app, so. Wait, wait, whoops, that's not right. Ah, ah what are you doing? Oh, here we go. Bear with me, uh, ah yes, this was CD app. And I'm going to do npm start. And what's going to happen here, you're going to see a couple of things happening on the right. And what's happening on the right is like now my f -sharp code, which is like just f -sharp code, is taken by, uh, by Fable. Fable is compiling into JavaScript. It's going to produce something which is entirely JavaScript. So now it's compiled and it's ready to go. And I have a local application which is running in JavaScript. So I love this because like uh, I have like a, so confession time is I have never ever written a line of JavaScript in my life. I don't do web apps. I don't know any of these things. And with Fable, in like literally five minutes, I became a full stack uh, developer. Like uh, I'm using NPM, I'm using Webpack, I'm using all the buzzwords, and this is exciting. So let me show you like now the running application. So the running application should be up here. It's here. So I also mentioned that I was not a web developer, so you're going to see this in a second. This is probably the ugliest game uh, UI you have ever seen, but like this is a, an implementation of what I just showed you. So what do I see here? I have a game of D&D where, so this is fine, I'm disconnected. I have a game of D&D where I see in, in blue like three wolves, in orange like three goblins, and this is going to simulate turns. So on the right here, I see the, the things I can do. This is showing me all the actions I can perform. And uh, I have a couple more things. So for instance, here, it's the turn of this goblin here. And because a goblin is a coward, it's going to go south, 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 south. And I can see that I can attack uh, maybe one of the wolves. So I'm going to attack it with a bow. And what you can see on the right is you can see first like the state of each of the creatures. And you can see also every command I have been emitting and the result of the way it's been processed. So I can validate like all the steps of my application. So the goblin was not very successful, so it's going to finish its turn. This one is also going to go southeast because it's also a coward. And it's going to finish its turn. And this one is going to shoot. And, uh, and that one uh, hit. So now uh, like the wolf here went from 11 hit points to eight. And so I'm going to keep going. So what I'm showing you here is like probably the worst possible way to play Dungeons and Dragons, right? It's like I mentioned, like the fun part is about storytelling, all that stuff. This is, uh, this, is, uh, this is awful, like this is ugly. But the reason I did this was like I also provided a way to automate this. So now it's like I can switch to automated. And instead of me moving my goblins and my wolves, it's like now I have like a primitive AI behind the scenes. And so now it's trying to, uh, so let's see, like uh, I see like a wolf and a goblin died. 
uh, it's doing a lot of stuff. Two goblins are dead. The third one is dead. So it looks like right now, just on like one case, it looks like the wolves, like three wolves, three goblins would be like favoring the goblins. But I need to do a bit more, so let's restart. Let's do another one. See if the goblins do any better. So the wolves are attacking. Wow, one of them is dead already. I don't know, it's like every time I can't resist like playing a couple of games, it's kind of fun to see what happens. Like, will the goblin survive? The goblin died again. Like, let's do a last one to see if, uh, to see what's, uh, what's going on. Maybe like, uh, maybe that was just a fluke. Yep. Uh, it's a good question. So it's like I mentioned that uh, right now there is an AI behind this. Like the, uh, I'm going to talk a bit more about this in a second. Like the AI currently is like pretty primitive. But like uh, they are doing some, uh, it's not random. It's like, uh, it's a bit of a dumb AI. So long story short is like what I showed you here is like first like uh, it was not very difficult to build. And uh, all I, I got like a nice uh, visual uh, simulation of my system. I can see what's happening. And uh, I, I'm in a place where I could actually run that fight one million times and uh, get an answer to the question. What's the likelihood of wolves winning, uh, three wolves winning against three goblins? So this is progress. So what's missing at that point? Yeah, first, like the, uh, so I'm going to uh, go quick on that part. Like the, uh, so what I needed, uh, that's kind of going to your question, is like what I need is automated decision making for the goblins and the wolves. And so uh, first, uh, first problem is like what should the creatures do? So how do I make them smart? A dumber problem is like what can actually creatures do? Like if you noticed uh, during uh, the, when the game was playing, is like uh, the list of actions you could perform went up and down. Uh, so what I did was, uh, so one problem which is annoying is that what I could do is I could give every creature the right to perform every possible action, including invalid ones. Like if you have a wall in front of you, you, maybe you want to go north, but then if you do, it's not possible, so we'll have to validate and revert. That's annoying. An easier thing would be to say like, how about I just give you actions which you can actually perform and remove all the things which are not possible. That way I don't need validation. And so that idea, I want to acknowledge another legendary creature who is uh, the legendary gnome droid Scott Vlashen, very high wisdom. I also recommend checking what he does. And in a talk a long time ago called, I think, uh, Enterprise Tic-Tac-Toe, he talked about something called capability uh, modeling. And the idea being, like, uh, it was in the context of security, like, uh, you can make security hard, let people do everything and validate if they're allowed to do it, or you can make it easier by just giving people the rights to do the things they're allowed to do. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. What I'm doing is I'm giving my creatures only the actions they can perform. That way I don't need any validation. You have a bucket of alternatives. This is what you can do. All you need is pick one. So that's uh, much simpler on the UI. It's also much simpler on the decision making. And so the way I, I built this was by uh, doing a small addition to my, uh, to my Fable uh, Elmish application. Instead of having just model update message, what I have is like uh, the, whenever the update is happening, I'm I have like a, what's called an agent or a mailbox processor and the update is receiving for the creature which can uh, act now, what is it that they can do, what is it that they see, and that module is going to give me back a message which is going to be pumped back in the update. So now the game plays itself, like uh, uh, I send the state to decision, decision gives me a message, go back to update, and so on and so forth. So this is how I got like this loop which goes forever. And to indirectly to your question, is like the thing which is nice is like now I can plug any AI I want in the decide function. Like all I need is to do a function which, given what you see, what should you do? Conclusion. So first, like a lot of things are missing. Like uh, I started this thinking this would be a, a couple of weekend projects. I've been on this for like over a year. Part of it is because I don't have time, but part of it is it's actually difficult. Like the rules, uh, there is a lot of rules to implement. In particular, I have been struggling, struggling a bit with things like area of effect, buffs, debuffs, like uh, I give you temporary more strength, stuff like that, magic. So I don't think magic is actually going to be very difficult, but I haven't had time to do it. Uh, I don't have like things like uh, terrain, walls, all that stuff. So there's a lot of details I need to do, but these are like not that bad. Uh, probably another five years and I'll be done. Uh, the other piece which is missing is really smart decisions. Like right now, like the way goblins and wolves make decisions is pretty primitive. Uh, and so what I really want to do is uh, kind of tying back to my introduction, which is like one of the topics I care about is machine learning. And so what I want is essentially to build like Skynet for goblins, I want to do like a reinforcement learning where uh, I'm go the, the idea behind reinforcement learning is you take a game and you let the game play itself over and over and over again 
And uh, if you see things which work, you should do more of them. If you, should, if you see things which don't work, you should do less of them. And so that's what I want to do. So uh, the, the problem is that I just didn't have, the time to, uh, didn't have the time to finish that yet, but this is where it's headed. So Skynet is actually potentially going to come from a D&D Goblin simulator. And that's what I had, like, so I'm going to skip on this. So uh, I think this is uh, where I'm going to leave it. So what I want is like, I want to thank you for coming to the talk. And because we're in a D&D theme, I'm also going to cast Bless so that you can have all your checks at plus four uh, during the rest of the conference. So you can find me on Twitter as adbrandevender. You can find my blog where I have a lot of this material uh, discussed at brandevender.com. The GitHub repository is there as well. And uh, this is what I had, so thank you very much. I think we even have like five minutes for questions if people have questions. Yes? Question, yeah, the, yeah, the question is would I be approaching Wizards of the Coast, like the publisher of D&D? &D? Uh, I think I'm too far away from uh, doing that. Like the, uh, plus is like, uh, it looks also like, uh, that would be fun because I was hoping also to find an API for things that give me the characteristics of all the monsters. So if I could integrate with something else, this would be great. Right now I see this like just as a weekend project, uh, but like uh, maybe uh, in uh, 10 years when I'm done with the implementation of the rules, I might do that. Yep. So the, uh, the comment is like probably other people have been looking at the same problem. I suspect it's true because uh, in my experience, like the intersection between developers and D&D players is pretty large. And I think I'm, I'm probably not the only one to, uh, to have had this idea. To be honest, is like uh, the, uh, I, uh, it's kind of related to the other question as well. Is like uh, I haven't really looked very much at what other people have been doing. Is like uh, a lot of times is like uh, when I have a problem, I uh, tend to ignore what other people have been doing and just, uh, do it my own way and uh, learn by doing mistakes. So it's like uh, I haven't really done uh, much research. Uh, exactly, like uh, exactly. I do this because it's fun and because it's a, a learning exercise. More questions? Yes. So the question uh, was about like, uh, it looks like uh, I'm going to uh, translate as like, uh, it looks like the uh, uh, using, uh, using discriminated unions to model expression is, uh, is nice, but like how, do, maybe how do you get there or can you recommend examples or like where to start? I would say like uh, uh, looking uh, in general, like looking at Thomas Petrichek's talk is a good start. Like one I would recommend, he has a, uh, I would say half his talks contain this idea. Like one I would probably recommend is that NDC Sydney, I think uh, NDC Oslo two or three years ago, he had one where he implemented from scratch uh, a version of Excel, which is uh, using these patterns and really building up. So that, uh, that would be a good, uh, I would say look at his material, that would be a good place to look. Yes? Yes, I do. Yeah, 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 so the, the, that was not a question but a comment. The comment was like, first, like this is indeed an XKCD t-shirt. Uh, and uh, yeah, I like it, like it's my uh, speaking t-shirt. And I love it also because it's recursive. Like if you look at it, like uh, so uh, it also, uh, it contains all sorts of charts which are in white on black, measuring like the amount of white on the t-shirt. And I hear, I don't know if it's an urban legend or not, but I hear that uh, the small, medium, large, and extra large version are different because each of them would have actually a different proportion. I don't know if it's true, but I think it's plausible given uh, the, uh, the person behind it. Cool, then I th how about we uh, stop there? So again, thank you, and have a fantastic rest of the conference.